everybody. Welcome to The List. I'm Jesse Combs. And I'm Patrick McIntyre. Today, we're in San Rafael at the west coast end of the original Lincoln Highway, about to embark on a 2,000-mile journey eastward through the main streets of America. We're competing in the Great Race, a road rally that travels on historic routes all throughout America. Scores are based on precision driving and navigational skills, all while driving vintage vehicles. Pre-1972 vintage vehicles, and you will not believe what it is that we're driving. And this year, Jesse also has the honor of being the Grand Marshal of the race as well. Yep, and the green flag is about to drop, so come along with us as we check Race a Road Rally off our list. I've had a love affair with cars my whole life. I build them in my shop, and I race them both on and off-road. I've spent years on the auto show circuit talking about cars, but now it's time to get behind the wheel and find the next adventure. Together, we're setting out to tackle all things that every car enthusiast should do. This is The List. instructions and I feel like I feel worse than I did in trigonometry class right now so here we are at day one of our nine day trip and to be totally honest with you I don't know what to expect I have no idea what I'm getting myself into which tends to be the way that we do these things what is the great race well it's a journey that takes you to all of these cool places that you may never ever find on your own and you do it as slow as possible when you think of the great race you can't think of it as a race you have to think of it as a skilled game of chess. There is a massive amount of skill involved in being able to drive hundreds of miles each day at very specific speeds for very specific times. It's a timed rally, so they know how long it takes you to get from point A to point B. One second sooner, one second later, and you get penalized. If you get right on that exact second that you're supposed to be there, you ace. You win for that leg. You get a sticker that goes in your car. You get a $1,000 prize for every time you ace. It seems impossible for Jesse and I to be able to do this. But I know it's possible because I've seen cars that have doors full of stickers, A stickers all the way up and down their car. If you're good at following rules, if you're good at following instructions, and if you're good at going slow and maintaining a consistent speed, you'll do great at this race. Are you good at it? I am not good at following rules. I am not good at following instructions. I am not good at driving slow. And uh, what was the other one? This is a 1927 Bugatti Type 35B. There were only 25 of these made in period. They were the most successful, arguably, race cars ever built. This car won in its time over a thousand races. At the same time that a Model T was the most popular automobile in the United States, being able to do top speed of 35 miles an hour, this car could do 130. They don't exist anymore, really. You know, any successful race car gets blown up, smashed up, and the only thing left is stories. Right. This car was built six months ago. What we did is we took all of the original manufacturing techniques, we embraced the technology from the 20s, copied that process, copied the original engineering. So this is exactly what would have come off the assembly line in 27 from Molsheim. The Tori Bugatti had an otherworldly kind of perspective on things, and he didn't just improve on prior principles, he came up with all kinds of new stuff for the first time. This is the first car that ever had alloy wheels. Not only that, but the drums are part of the wheel casting. They're not separate, which means that you have all that extra aluminum to wick the heat off. The front axle is a hollow forging to reduce unsuspended weight so that it handles better. The engine itself is only 2.3 liters, which everybody's amazed by because it's so rowdy and loud. Having the support crew that we have of Joe and John, John being the owner of the car and Joe being the mechanic in the car, I think that's essential to this. Um, nothing has gone seriously wrong with the car, but we also have someone who knows every inch of that vehicle looking at it. Every morning, I walk out with a cup of coffee, and Joe is working on the car. And that brings a peace of mind knowing that the car is ready for us, and it's going to be safe for the next leg of the journey. The Persane Bugatti was built to race. It's a race car. It wants to go fast. And occasionally, we got to open her up. But mostly, the great race is a test of accuracy, not speed. Okay, I want you to bring me up to 35. 35. Go ahead. 
Patrick and I have done a lot of driver navigator events together throughout this whole series, and he is a fantastic navigator, especially considering the fact that he kind of just gets thrown into the wolves, has never had any training, and has to just figure it out on the spot. He's doing a fantastic job. I don't know if I'd really want to do any sort of event like this without him. Every sign has a different set of instructions. So the next one, we're going to reduce our speed for a certain amount of time. Once that time is up, then we increase our speed. Yep. All right, bring it down to 22 and down to 20. For 36 seconds, we're going to go 20 miles an hour. I want to show you something, because I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around this. What I've been given by someone is a speed chart. This is for a different car that's similar to ours. It roughly tells me how long it will take our car to go from, let's say, 30 miles an hour to a dead stop. That takes about two seconds. It also shows me how long it will take to go from zero to, let's say, 50. That takes six seconds. So if I'm coming to a stop sign at 30 and I'm going out of that stop sign at 50, that's an eight second loss. Each stop sign, we're told to stop for about 15 seconds. So I take that number, I subtract it from the 15, and that's how long we sit and wait exactly seven seconds before I tell Jesse to go again. And if you want to do the math, you add how long it takes to go from zero to 40, plus how long it takes to go from 30 to zero, plus the factoring in of whether or not we're coming to a turn. Then you got to know how many percentage points you have to make up. And if you do that, you do 10% faster for 10 seconds. That earns you one second ahead. This is so much math. I, my brain, it, none of this makes any sense anymore. And if you want to play this game right, you have to get these numbers exact. Therefore, I don't think we're playing this game right. There are some people on this rally that take it very seriously. Like, this isn't their only rally. They do this all of the time. All the time. So their whole life revolves around 15 seconds, stop, go, nothing else other to do, don't get in my way. The majority of the people that are participating in this rally have done it many years, so they know what to do. They know how to stay on time. They know how to get their aces. And we are getting in their way. Not intentionally. This is Gary Martin. Uh, Gary, I have you here because I want to ask you some questions. You guys are the team to beat when it comes to this. With us being in this race, newbies, we're filming a show, we got a lot of crew with us here. What, what is the word on the street? Are people waiting for this Bugatti to break down for us to get out of the way, or what? what's the deal? And you can be honest with me, it's just you and me and, you know, in the camp. Love, love to have the interest, <laughs> but when we're racing for $50,000, how do we diplomatically tell you that you're in the way? Yep. <laughs> how do you say, I mean, What's amazing is that every city we show up in, it's a car show. I mean, literally, there's already like 100 cars there, and then we show up and we make it an even better car show. And so many people are waiting for us to come through and shake our hand and take pictures with the cars and get autographs. It's, it's kind of cool. You feel like a rock star everywhere you go in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> the Finns are awesome. But those guys are party animals. They get the job done. They're dirty every day. I swear, every day they look more and more awesome. It's a it's a 1918 American LaFrance uh, Speedster, and it has a nine and a half liter four cylinder motor. Uh -huh. It's got four coffee cans going bump, 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 like that, and it's uh, it's a, what's called a T head motor, which is an ancient form of technology. It's extremely reliable, but it runs at about 1,200 RPM. Let's see how low I can get it to go. That's all the way. How rad is that? You guys must feel like the coolest guys in the world. Like, yeah, what up, ladies? What up? The fact that we're taking the Lincoln Highway, it means something special. We take for granted the highways and the freeways that we take now, where we just zip from point A to point B. The road we're on, the Lincoln Highway, is the original connection between basically the coasts. And so we're getting a chance to go places we would have never gone before. We're getting a chance to go to these small towns that used to be hustling and bustling, but once the freeways were established, they kind of fell to the wayside. But they shouldn't have because there's a lot to see. There's great people, there's great scenery, there's great environments that I feel like sometimes we miss out on because we're in such a hurry to get from here to there. The first thousand miles of the journey took us from California through the harsh desert heat of Nevada and Utah, and finally climbing up into Wyoming. And though we gradually grew more comfortable with the car mechanically, the constant heat and wind took a toll on our physical and mental health. I don't know what's going on. I'm so out of it. 
We're in another town. Jesse's throwing ice at me because I'm sweating. I'm just, I'm so sweaty. Everything is sweaty. Patrick and I are literally straddling the transmission. There is no heat protection whatsoever. The heat literally comes down through the throttle pedals, through the floor. Everything that we touch inside the car is hot. The other day we drove for four and a half, five hours in 103 to 105 degree heat. For about a couple hours, I couldn't figure out if I wanted to leave my hands out so they could burn in the sun or hide them under, down by where my feet go and let them burn from the, from the heat from the engine. Hat. Goggles, bandanas on our faces, long sleeve shirts, gloves, breathable clothes. Jesse has to wear gloves the entire time because the steering wheel itself, I've held it, it's incredibly hot. I have sweat coming out of my shoes. That's not possible. Is that possible? Yeah, look. See it squishing out? Oh, gross. I don't even know what town we're in right now. My senses are so blurred. I can't feel my face and my skin. And I can't hear anything. Ew. What? My theme song is I Can't Drive 55. I can't hear you. I can't hear anything right now. All I hear is just... Do we need to get you some earplugs? Are you losing it? Yep, I'm going delirious out there, singing songs, telling every good living thing to eat and die. <laughs> this is torture. This is a, a endurance test, a grueling endurance test of torture. We're going crazy out there. So we've created our own band. The car has its own rhythm, and Patrick has his own rhythm. I scream like an animal. It's pretty amazing. You guys should come to one of our shows. The schedule is brutal. We wake up early, we leave early, we drive all day, we stop and have lunch. We try to get out as quickly as possible so we can get on the road, meet our times. We end up at our final location. We talk to people for two hours because all the locals want to know about our cars. And then we finally get to have dinner about 10 o'clock at night and we're exhausted by that time. And then we have to turn around and do it all over again the next day. It's kind of an anomaly for me. I've been around cars my whole life and it's just something different. There's an other about these pre-war Grand Prix cars. It's something special, it's something different. And I, I, I've yet to find the words, but it's, it's definitely something that has brought my level of passion for cars to a new level. It's something that you can't just hop in and be good at. You have to spend time. Seat time is the key to becoming good at driving it or good at working on it or knowing, knowing what it wants when it wants it. I can't tell you how much I am loving this car. It is becoming an extension of me. I love this car. I don't want to give it back. As with anything that we end up doing as far as adventure, we really poorly think things out before we get into them. <laughs> but it seems to be working out. We've gone almost 1,400 miles and without a hitch, and the car still runs like it new. A little bit of power loss at altitude. I think we're at about 7,000 feet. But other than that, it's, it's ACs. leg was awesome for me coming through those mountains it was nice and cool having the snow right there the lakes the glacial lakes that were up there that was really cool <laughs> i'm excited i'm looking forward to uh, the black hills and the dakotas coming up next so. that's my real home the dakotas that's my real home i cannot wait to be home the best part about the great race is that you get to drive across America and see some of the most amazing sights that America has to offer. Like one of our most iconic national monuments, Mount Rushmore. Now, it may not be the first time that Jesse and I have seen Mount Rushmore, but it is the first time that we've arrived in style. Now, I will say this car has changed the game of driving through the Black Hills. I've done it on motorcycles, I've done it in trucks, you name it, I've done it. But this just takes it to a whole new level.
So after a long day of driving, we finally made it to Jesse's hometown. And this is the biggest party that we have seen on this entire trip. I'd like to say that they're all here for me. They are all here for you, They're here Jesse. for you, Patrick. No, they're, they're here for, for you. you. Well, let's so, go celebrate. Let's celebrate. Let's do it. Rapid City through the beautiful Badlands across the long, hot, straight, windy state of South Dakota to right here in Sioux Falls. Now, we realize at this point in the race, we're not exactly in contention for a championship because this is a race of extremes. Yeah, extreme people, extreme cars, extreme distance, and you put all of that together and you get a very unique racing community. And we are in the final leg until we cross that finish line in Moline, and we will cross that finish line in Moline. We might be last place, but we'll get there. This is it. We're on the final leg and I'm having a lot of mixed emotions because this whole trip I've been thinking I can't wait to get out of this car. But at the same time, the sights and the things I've seen and the people I've met and just being here with the crew and, and with Jesse, like I realize that I gotta go back to real life. It's mixed because it's been a, a brutal, intense race. But at the same time, I kind of don't want it to end. The Great Race was an incredible adventure, and it's so cool that Persane builds these cars to be living, breathing machines. Not parked behind ropes at a museum, but out on the open road, racing. This, this driver is a very special friend of the Great Race. She is the Grand Marshal of the 2016 Heming Motor News Great Race, presented by Harry, Miss Jessie Combs! So after nearly 3,000 miles of driving through sun, wind, and beautiful scenery. We got to give a lot of thanks to Persang and the Great Race for giving us the opportunity. And I think we can officially check Race in a Road Rally off our list. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.